Welcome to the next episode of Real Zuri's Leadership Series for the Canadian real estate industry. I'm your host, Micheline Bentley from Matrix 360, and we're excited to collaborate and partner with Informa to deliver a platform for leaders to share their experiences. The intent of our dialogue series is to really engage with business leaders and share their insight and wisdom. Before we commence, a little tidbit about Matrix 360. We're a talent management and advisory platform that bridges uh, the human experience with business innovation. It's with great privilege and responsibility that we partner and advocate for people in our industry. So today we're here at the Canadian Real Estate Forum in Toronto, Canada. We are honored to join, be joined by Dennis Lopez, CEO. Thank you for being here, CEO of Quadrille. And um, we're really excited to talk to you and learn a little bit more about your personal journey. So as a global leader, someone who's lived and worked all over the world, um, could you tell us a little bit about the work that you currently do and why it matters to you? So uh, I'm currently uh, CEO of a company called Quadrill. Quadrill is basically a company that was recently formed. In fact, it was just completed being formed in May of this year. Uh, effectively, what was done was the province of British Columbia's pension fund decided to take back its real estate, uh, put it into a company called Quadril and manage it itself. So, um, so it's been a, a great um, experience so far and hopefully will continue that way. Uh, we um, uh, took back $27 billion in assets. Uh, we took 700 people back from the advisors. We hired uh, 350 people and we've built what I feel is a, a really strong company. And uh, we have, you know, uh, very um, strong aspirations to continue that growth. So we would hope to, um, in the next five years, uh, maybe come close to even doubling the size of the company. Of course, we have to uh, have cooperative markets to invest. And, you know, right now, to be honest with you, we're going slower than that pace might um, uh, warrant just because we want to be careful and make sure that the investments we're making are right. So um, the most uh, rewarding thing about it is that we're doing all this for the um, uh, uh, public employees of the province of British Columbia. So the work that we do um, uh, supports the pensions of you know the teachers, the firemen, the policemen. So um, it, it's really kind of nice actually to, to think mm -hmm. that if you're doing a good job you know you're helping these people out. Right. And is there any personal objectives that you have as a leader that you're really excited about? You know, I've had an opportunity to work in a number of different companies and work um, with a number of different firms around the world. So, you know, this is a chance for me to take what I think is the best things that I've seen through my career and try and implement them in a blank sheet of paper effectively. Right. So, um, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, we're... Um, we have a very research-focused approach because we, um, uh, you know, feel that you know, real estate is a massive industry with um, uh, lots of um, sometimes good and not so good information. So if you really work at it, you can get a competitive advantage. Uh, we also, I think, are interested in maybe. Um, really taking a look at where real estate's going. So um, we're. we're we are taking probably more concentrated bets than other people do. We believe in coming up with high conviction investment themes. So diversity for the sake of diversity is not the theme at Quadril. Right. It's um, do your homework, get conviction, and yeah. then really focus on those areas of either property types or sectors, you know, geographic areas right. of the world and where you think you can get out performance and focus on doing the best you can there. So let's go back and look at your personal career journey leading up to this point. Can you recall something that you did, maybe a project, maybe it was volunteer based and maybe it was like to what, to what you're doing right now, that really had a positive impact on who you are as a person today? I guess it was kind of midway through my career. I used to work for JP Morgan and they sent me over to Europe to start up uh, a real estate investment banking business. It was back in the days when uh, people didn't really know what a real estate investment banker was. Uh, it, the industry had just kind of started in the U.S., was maybe about five to seven years old. Uh, what was interesting about that was um, I knew nothing about the markets uh, and um, had to put together a team of people. There was no, quote, real estate investment bankers to go hire because the industry didn't exist, so I had to find 
talented people with some backgrounds and knowledge. Uh, these people had to come from all across Europe, so they had to speak different languages, come from all different cultures. So it was really, it was, it was really, um, it was really an interesting opportunity to take all these different cultures, meld right. people together in a team, and effectively uh, create a business that didn't exist. Yeah. And uh, and you know, it, it worked out. Uh, we had a really uh, nice run uh, early on. There was no competition, yeah. so. Uh, so things out, worked out really well, and then over time the industry kind of developed and yeah. became what it is today. But, um, but that was uh, you know, a, t a time where um, you know, you're working to get hired by people, they're paying you very uh, meaningful fees, you can't speak their language, and, uh, yeah. you know, and trying to show them how you can add value is a real challenge. How do you feel like that shaped you as a person, like in terms of as a leader today, you know? Well, you have to be super flexible, right? Yeah. So there's no right way. Um, you know, I remember the first time I drove through Milan, you know, I looked at the quality of the real estate there. I was used to more of New York City, right. and it definitely isn't that standard. But you have to appreciate how you, you know, have to kind of tailor your um, expectations on properties to where the market's at. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, it really helped. Um, me uh, learn to be a more flexible person, learn to be more flexible in terms of how I think, and then also too, you know, requires you to kind of um, be kind of quick on your feet too, because it's kind of hard yeah. to plan. Yeah, and see how adaptable you can be to make that work. And obviously, it did work out. So, because <laughs> you're here today. Um, <laughs> Was there a moment um, that resonates with you when you kind of look back at your journey? And obviously you've had a lot of different experiences and challenges that you faced where you realize that not only are you a leader, but you now have an opportunity to make change or influence change. Yeah, I, well, I worked for J.P. Morgan for about 20 years. Okay. And, um, you know, J.P. Morgan's a big name, powerful. Um, firm and um, you know you hand somebody your business card and, and the fact that JP Morgan's on it typically gets you meetings and kind of get you where you need to be uh, I decided I wanted to go to the buy side from the advisory side so I went to go work for a startup hedge fund and what was kind of interesting was is that um, I was very happy to find out that it wasn't just the fact that JP Morgan on the car was on the car but also the fact that Dennis Lopez was on the card was was okay so I was very um, happy to um, find that it's trying to start up this business because it was a de novo uh, kind of startup in terms of investing yeah. in equity across Europe that, um, that you know, uh, I was still able to, um, you know, get access to people, capital, um, transactions, investments. So it was really kind of a real eye opener. When you work for a big firm that powerful, sometimes you kind of don't think the individual matters, but right. it was nice to find out that... Um, so you saw a correlation there, like, yeah, was, I have some influence. Nice. Yeah, just, and it, yeah. it seems like it's a theme for you, you know, going into a startup situation or creating something new that doesn't exist and then making it work. Yeah, I, I, I like startups. I like trying new things. Um, obviously, there are things that I think, you know, have a reasonable chance to succeed. I'm probably not quite as entrepreneurial as some of the people we've just been talking to over the last two days in the tech things. I'm not quite sure I'm a two guys in the garage kind of guy, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm definitely someone who um, likes to, um, uh, you know, try new things um, and um, start up businesses and, um, and uh, take advantage of what I think opportunities are mm -hmm. that aren't really um, being uh, capitalized on. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about mentorship for a second. If you were to look back at your 20-year-old self, what piece of advice would you give your 20-year-old self knowing what you know now? Would you have done anything differently or what would you say? Well, you know, uh, you, you, know I, you come out of business school, I came out with an MBA and you're kind of all kind of very analytical and very um, probably a little bit too much testosterone and, uh, <laughs> and really kind of crunching the numbers. Yeah. And um, at the end of the day, though, that really isn't what makes you successful. Um, you know, kind of the advice I would have given myself I kind of fell into uh, working for J.P. Morgan, mm -hmm. and but it worked out great. The quality of people that I was surrounded by mm -hmm. was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And most important, though, was the network I got out of that. And I think that's the lesson I would have given myself. I probably wasn't as focused at that age on uh, building relationships, building friendships, uh, networking with these people all around me who were exceptional people who all have gone on to do exceptional things. 
and it's kind of more focused on kind of being a, it's probably more focused on, you know, the quant and the analytics side. So what I would say to myself is, you know, make sure you work for good companies yeah. uh, and surround yourself with strong people, build relationships and stay in touch. That network, which, you know, I've been able to have because I worked there for so long, has been extraordinarily helpful in my career. Yeah, the value of human connection and, and staying in touch, yeah, especially in real estate, it's all about the people, right? Yeah, and, well, in real estate, it's, you know, it's like it's, we talked about, it's a massive industry, and, um, uh, you know, knowing people around the world um, is, is critical in yeah. terms of sourcing capital, sourcing transactions, and also kind of seeing trends and ideas that will right. move from one part of the world to the other. Right. Is there a mentor in your life that um, has given you some words of wisdom that you could share that you're like, has really helped shape the leader that you are today? Well, there was one of the guys I worked for at, at J.P. Morgan, uh, really was probably one of my first mentors. Mm -hmm. I think, and he was probably the guy that maybe made me appreciate a little bit more that mm -hmm. uh, that the human side of things is, uh -huh. if not equal, it's more important than um, some of the analytics. So he was a, a tremendous guy, um, kind of taught me that um, probably the most important thing to start off human relations is respect. He um, kind of, no matter what you said, how stupid your idea was or whatever, he would kind of treat it with respect and listen, and, um, but then, you know, kind of tell you exactly what he thought. So he had a very good manner of, about him in terms of how to work with people. Yeah. And um, so a lot of the lessons I learned from him was just watching him in action. Mm -hmm. But then he was very helpful to me in terms of kind of giving me some guidance on, um, you know, what's really important. Yeah. So, how um, to build relationships and build matters. relationships, how to, um, you know, how to treat other people. Yeah. And um, he, he's, he was really, truly amazing. He's a friend today, That's still awesome. to this day, yeah. stay in touch. And, That's uh, a true testament, isn't it? Yeah, he's, yeah. he's, he's, he's outstanding. I mean, it's, uh, and it's what's funny too, if I don't see him for a couple of years and then we go together for dinner, it's like that. that yeah, you know, we're kind of back to yeah. We're. That's amazing. And I think that's so important for people to understand. Like sometimes it's such basic information, but it's so relevant to like how and who you are. Um, Thinking back through your career, are there any factors that you've noticed that affect employees? You talk a lot about people and relationships and how important that is to you um, in the workplace as you see it today. Um, anything that kind of stands out when you think about the workplace and, and engagement with employees? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, in the workplace, one of the things I think you really need to do is create trust. And you can create trust first by respecting people, but if you think about it, if you trust someone when they come up and ask you to do something or tell you about something, you do it. Uh, if you don't trust someone, then you kind of check with other people, maybe you don't do it, you know. Uh, what that does is if you just think about it, it really clogs up organizations because organizations are making decisions all the time. Yeah. And when you haven't built up a network of trust in the organization, it doesn't work right. uh, efficiently. Yeah. So. What we're trying to do at Quadrill is, is um, create an environment where we have respect for everybody. Everybody builds trust amongst each other and we can operate extremely efficiency, efficiently because um, there's a general understanding, there's a general of, understanding of how you behave. Yeah. yeah, so it's really, you know, people talk about, you know, cultural kill strategy and it's really just trying to create a culture of high values, uh, integrity, and um, not only does it make it a better place to work, it's just more enjoyable to be in an environment like right. that, but it makes it a much more efficient and effective environment. Right, and that makes a lot of sense. We're gonna switch gears here for a second, and I'm sure you're familiar with some of these stats already, but um, according to the latest Stats Canada census report, 82% of the Canadian population, large, medium-sized cities and centers across the country are one of the highest G7 nations. Um, in 2016, Matrix did a diversity survey within the industry, and in Ontario, over 52% of the population in urban centers are female, yet 34% of them are leaders in that capacity. In Ontario, between 35 and 45% of the working population in urban centers identify as visible minorities. So, you know, people of visible color, different ethnicities, and so on. Yet less than 25% of them are in leadership positions. So. Considering this information, 
What are some of the challenges as a leader that you've kind of witnessed um, the course of your career, whether it be at JP or within real estate, maybe in the last little while, that um, affect these groups that I've identified, um, women racialized groups, regarding their access to opportunity and advancement in leadership? Sure. Well, look, it's all about people at the end of the day. Yeah. If you, I mean, if, look, if you have the best players on the team, you tend to win. And if uh, the people on the team tend to work together in a collaborative fashion, you tend to win. So uh, there's no any one uh, gender or, uh, or race or religion that has any uh, particular um, uh, priority over knowledge or capability or skills. So frankly, if you want to be a successful company, especially nowadays, Nowadays, in the integrated world we have, yeah. you have to be open to to all as, you know all peoples, <laughs> basically. Yeah. So, um, so, so I think our view is really simple: is that you know we, you know, we run a meritocracy. We try and open up um, uh, our opportunities to as many people as we can, and right. we're we're looking all over the world um, to. Um, to bring people into our company and let them advance. So we try and actually be um, uh, not thinking and not, not biased in any direction, only biased to people with talent. And I mean, obviously it hasn't always been that way or we'd see tons of people in different capacities and a leadership opportunity. Why do you think that is? Why it hasn't happened yeah. in the past? Um, I mean, it's slowly happening, but you know, um, what do you think is preventing that? People tend to be more comfortable with people like themselves, you know. So, I mean, I think it's it, it's kind of groupings all over. It's, uh, so, um, I think that, you know, you have to be um, curious. Yeah. Probably curiosity is yeah. what leads to um, being open to other cultures, other ideas. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that's probably not yeah. as common as we'd all like it. Right. And you were talking earlier about your exposure to, you know, going from a global, going to a global position where you had to engage people from different cultures and areas and put them in positions where you had to trust them. So what advice would you give other leaders who are looking to maybe implement that a little bit more proactively and understand like I really want to be more inclusive of like the environment that's reflective out there um, in the world of you know our customer base and so on and so forth. Well look I think you have to do it because you want to. I don't think you have to do it. You, I don't think if you're doing it because you have to it's just not going to work. Right. So I think what helps is kind of a um, inherent curiosity about other yeah. people, other places, yeah. other things. And, um, and an openness to looking at what other people value and respecting that and, um, and learning. Right. Um, when you think of the future, what excites you? What, what are you excited about? It really is technology. I yeah. mean, I think, you know, the changes that are going on today are absolutely spectacular. We just went through a presentation yesterday morning where we're talking about 10 industries being completely disrupted. So what do I mean by that? If we look back at the music industry, you know, right. when I was a kid, it was records and uh, DVDs, and, and nowadays everything's free, it doesn't cost anything, you know? Yeah. Uh, same thing with publishing, you know, used to read newspapers. Um, and um, now we're talking about um, the disruption in automobiles, disruption in many other industries. So it's just unbelievable what's going on. Yeah. So what's exciting about that is, you know, once again, you can kind of look at it like, oh no, you know, what happens to those industries? Or you can look at it like, wow, uh, when these things change, what's that gonna mean for this? And kind of like, what are the opportunities that come out of that? So, so we're very much focused on the opportunities. We're trying to think of how it's gonna impact um, you know, real estate. One of the nice things about real estate, it's not the stock market, so you've got longer than maybe five seconds or a nanosecond to respond. Yeah. So if you can be thoughtful, uh, we think that, you know, this is going to create new opportunities, which we'll look to capitalize on. Yeah. And you just moderated a panel on technology and real estate, yeah. so uh, quite... That's because I like it. <laughs> quite fitting, yes. Um, what sort of footprint would you like to leave as your legacy in the business community? I think it's really um, uh, that um, being open-minded yeah. and working in firms and allowing them to 
uh, grow and capture opportunities that they might not have. So kind of uh, creating an environment of diversity and inclusion, creating an environment of openness and trust, and creating an environment of collaboration and teamwork where you go out and capture these opportunities. Yeah, that's great. Okay, last question. What is one word you would use to capture the essence of who you are as a leader? <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, what was one word? I think I'd go back to curious. Mm -hmm. I like that. I'm intellectually curious on most things. <laughs> well, when there's curiosity, there's new knowledge, right? So. Well, or at least an attempt at it. <laughs> Whether it's successful or not, that we don't know about that. Well, have a great trip back Thank you. to Vancouver. Thank you for spending the time to be here with us and share your insight and have a conversation with us. It was really engaging. On behalf of Matrix 360 and Forma Canada, we appreciate the time that you've taken and everyone to listen to this. Um, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Matrix 360 and Informa, please check us out on our website. Thanks so much.